Hello, and welcome to our Spotlight on Medical Diagnostics. On behalf of the Saskatoon Industry Education Council, I want to welcome you to our event tonight. Thank you to RBC Future Launch for helping to power our Spotlight on Careers event. We acknowledge we are on Treaty 6 territory and homeland of the Métis. And we want to welcome students, parents, and teachers from across Saskatchewan who are joining us tonight for our event and those who are watching the recording afterwards. Thank you for tuning in. For the past two decades, the Saskatoon Ind Industry Education Council has bridged the gap between Sask Saskatchewan school systems and employers providing experiential learning and career development opportunities for Saskatoon and area youth. As a registered nonprofit organization, the SIEC works in partnership with three school divisions and the Saskatoon Tribal Council, as well as community-based organizations, government agencies, and employers to help nurture the workforce of tomorrow. And with COVID, we are happy that we're able, we are able to now welcome students from across the province to our virtual event. Last year, the SIEC worked with over 30,000 youth over 3,300 business and post-secondary representatives, and more than 450 educators and career practitioners. And the SIEC hosts over 40 programs and events every year, including our Spotlight on Careers, which you are tuning into right now, which is a series of targeted events providing students with experiential learning opportunities to explore potential career paths. Our skills boot camps, which provide students with hands on experiences in various careers. Our connected event, which is a women mentorship program connecting females in grades 10 through 12 with mentors from a wide variety of sectors in our province. And our summer youth internship program, which is a six week paid internship where students gain uh, experience in the construction, manufacturing, automotive, and culinary industries. And with this program, students have the opportunity to earn competitive wages as well as high school credit. So be sure to check out our website and to follow us on social media to stay up to date on our program offerings. So for our event tonight, I want to encourage you to use the Q&A function if you have any questions for any of our presenters. Um, we try not to use the chat. It's a little bit easier to monitor the questions through the Q&A, so please use the Q&A. And if you have a question for a particular presenter, you can specify who that question is for. Or if you just have a question in general, please be sure to put it in there, and we will try to answer it throughout our event. So I want to thank all of our panelists who are joining us tonight. We are going to start off with our first panelist of the evening, Tammy Lowe or Tammy Lowe, sorry, and she is with us tonight from the Saskatchewan Health Authority. Tammy is a workforce planning and employment specialist with the Saskatchewan Health Authority. Tammy has worked with the SHA for several years, years during this time which she has held many different positions. One of the advantages, and there are several, of working with the SHA is having the opportunity to try different positions and work in different departments. She has now found her passion in her position as a specialist in human resources. Tammy enjoys the challenge of working to better the, her community and the province. She loves to see how the work she does impacts people of Saskatchewan. While we tend to focus on the direct personal client care that healthcare workers provide, Tammy's role with human resources looks at the bigger picture, ensuring the right people are doing the right jobs at the right time. Tammy is very devoted to supporting others on their career journey from onboarding new employees through to mentorship and is waiting anxiously to resume in-person general orientation and facilitating mentorship workshops. Along with onboarding and mentorship, Tammy provides various HR supports to a provincial portfolio. These areas of support include medical imaging, laboratory medicine, maternal and children's provincial programming, quality and safety, as well as strategy and innovation. The variety within the portfolio uh, enables Tammy to continue to grow and be challenged, all while providing excellent support in these areas. Away from work, Tammy enjoys spending time with her family, but if she's not spending time with her family, you will find her completing the daily WOD workout of the day at her favorite CrossFit gym. So please welcome Tammy.
Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Michelle. Welcome to those joining us tonight and those that will be watching the recording in future to learn more about the Saskatchewan Health Authority and to hear from those who are currently working in medical imaging and laboratory services teams. One of the most exciting parts of my job is recruitment, especially when I get to recruit the next generation of healthcare workers. We are always excited to share information about occupations in healthcare, and we hope that today helps you make an informed decision about your career path. The teams within medical diagnostics are involved in, in the patient's healthcare journey. Although COVID has impacted our work environment, it has showcased the essential and versatile role of healthcare professionals. As a healthcare provider, you have the opportunity to travel as a professional, as I have with my own career path. You may choose to specialize within a specific department or choose to work in a department or facility that you are utilizing your skills in many different situations. In any environment you work in, you will be a part of an interprofessional team and will have the ability to make a difference in people's lives. The Saskatchewan Health Authority is a unionized employer. There are three provider unions. We have SEIU, QP, and SGEU, as well as we have SUN, and that's for the nurses, and health sciences, and that's our allied healthcare professionals, such as social workers or infection control practitioners. As a unionized employer, that means there are specific rules beyond labor laws that govern the employment for our staff. The foundation for our unions is seniority. This is what derives selection for jobs and the shifts that are picked up folks to work. It also creates standardization across the authority in terms of wages and benefits. When considering a healthcare profession, the needs in healthcare are 24 seven. Therefore, there are day, evening, night shifts, as well as you may be required to work on holidays. An additional consideration with the SHA is the benefits that are offered. We have extended health care, uh, dental plans, uh, we have pension, life and disability insurance. We also have an employee and family assistant, assistance program, um, of course, annual vacation. Um, and at, our, pardon me, at the three acute sites, we also have on-site fitness facilities. Starting wages for some of the professions that you will hear from tonight are from $35.91 per hour to $44.19 per hour. They're um, within the provider unions, it is a three step progression to the top wage. I would also like to mention that if you are to pursue one of these careers while awaiting to write your licensure, you are able to begin employment, um, but it would be at 90% of the wage. Our partnership with Saskatoon Industry Education Council helps us to achieve our vision and goals. SIEC work with students and counselors to identify those who are interested in pursuing health related careers. The partnership, this partnership has allowed for innovative ideas and engaging youth and career exploration opportunities such as this one. I would also like to mention that three of my colleagues from Workforce Planning and Employment have joined us tonight. Please welcome Matthew, Chelsea and Lindsay. We are happy to answer any questions you have during the question and answer portion of the evening. I hope you enjoy your presentations. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tammy, for joining us this evening. Next up, we have Jody Thompson, and she is with us tonight from Saskatchewan Polytechnic. Jody is currently a program head at Saskatchewan Polytechnic for the Medical Laboratory Technology Program. Jody is a graduate of the MLT program, has worked in both the private and public MLT laboratory sectors, and has been an MLT educator since 2005. As a program head, Jody has led all of the various programs within the medical diagnostics department at SAS Polytechnic, including CLXT, MLA, MLT, MRT, and phlebotomy. Jody is passionate about medical diagnostic professions and is always excited to encourage others to find their educational path to success. So please welcome Jody. Thank you, Michelle. So as Michelle mentioned, we do have five programs within our area. And within the area, we have the combined lab and x-ray program, the medical lab assistant program, the medical laboratory technology program, and the medical radiologic technology program. 
those areas um, you're going to hear from the professionals and I'm just going to give you a little bit of information about the what to expect as a student in our programs. So I do want to say Anisiqua, Aldante, Halkoda, Halkona, Halkola, Tawai, and Chanshi, and let you know that our SAS Polytech uh, campuses are on both Treaty 4 and Treaty 6 territories and traditional homeland of the Métis people. So we do have two intakes of our combined laboratory and x-ray program. We take in two different intakes of 20 students per year. So one beginning in August and one beginning in January annually. It is a competitive entry program beginning in the fall of 2022. We have the medical laboratory assistant program and we bring in 16 students to that program and it is a first qualified first admitted type of entry. We have the Medical Laboratory Technology Program. It is our largest program of 40 seats, and it too is competitive entry, and we have an annual intake in August. Our Medical Radiologic Technology Program, or sometimes referred to as our X-ray program, we take in 20 students to that program. It is competitive entry and it begins in August annually. And we have our phlebotomy program, which is our shortest program. And we actually do three intakes with them, 16 seats each session. And there are three different intakes throughout the academic year. Um, first one being in September, second one around November, and the third one about April. So, you might be wondering what it's like to be a student in our programs and the things that I can tell you about it is our class hours are variable daily so we are unlike a university where you have a set schedule every week. Um, hours will change day to day and week to week. There are occasionally requirements for an evening or a weekend class they we try to minimize those as much as possible. And our class and lab hours vary daily. So you, we do expect you to kind of check the schedule weekly because things do sometimes change for us. The hours of homework expected per week do vary between our programs. However, for our more rigorous programs, you can expect to about four to five hours of homework per day. Um, it can vary depending on your own studies and your own abilities, but typically we have students in class between 25 and 35 hours per week, and then we have homework over and above that. We do include a lot of hands-on learning and labs incorporated throughout our program. So you'll start labs really, really early into your program and you will have that ability to practice your skills and apply the theory that you're learning in a controlled environment really early on in your program. And once you have all of that underneath your belt, you will have a clinical practicum where you get to actually hone those skills and develop competence in those skills and be ready for the workplace when you graduate from our programs. Um, for the majority, with, with exception of phlebotomy, most of our programs are on-campus deliveries of theory and on-campus labs. We do have a lot of online learning activities associated with our courses and then a clinical practicum to follow. The exception is our phlebotomy program, which is delivered through continuing education, so it is more of a self-guided, self-directed study um with some scheduled labs and some scheduled clinicals you might be wondering what it takes to get into our programs as far as grades and this is a little bit of a busy uh, busy slide however i do think that it will tell you most of what you need to know um, so currently our clxts are still first qualified first admitted so if you do apply for next fall um, and if there are seats available you would be into that queue however beginning next fall it is competitive entry 
our MLAs is first qualified, first admitted. Our phlebotomy is first qualified, first admitted. And our MLT and MRT are both competitive entry. All of our programs do require grade 12. Some slight variations with our phlebotomy um, and with our MLA, but for the majority, you do need to see a minimum of 70% in your English language arts A30 and B30. Your math your, or your pre-calculus at a grade 12 level. We do require physical science 20, which is your grade 11 type of course for physical science. And we are pretty specific on this one. We don't actually accept the physical science or physics 30 as a replacement. And the reason for that is we are looking at the content that's delivered in your physical science course. And at SAS Polytech, we kind of expect that you've learned certain content in high school. We might dust it off a little bit, but we're going to actually start teaching you from that point. Um, and again, we wouldn't be like a university in this perspective in the fact that we don't make you basically redo your high school classes. We basically figure you figured that out, you learned that, now we're going to move on from there. So we are looking for physical science 20. Chem 30 is required. Um, there are exceptions again to the MLA and phlebotomy. We will accept that grade 12 or grade 11, sorry. And same thing with biology 30. For only MLA and, and the phlebotomy, we would accept a grade 11 um, course equivalent. For two of our programs, we do require a typing test, and that is for our MLA program and our phlebotomy program. And the reason for that is these are our two shortest programs. They do do a lot of technical data entry and key input into computers. And because the programs are so short, we don't have the time to develop those skills prior to you graduating from the program. And our stakeholders really do need people who have good keyboarding skills and um, good accuracy. So those two programs do require you to do a typing test to come into. The other ones are much longer programs. Our CLXT is a two year program. Our MLT program is two and a half years and our MRT program is a two year program. So we have a lot more time to assist students with developing those skills. You should also um, have a criminal record check with a vulnerable sector search. Because we are teaching programs where you will be entering into a healthcare environment, we do require a clear criminal record check with a vulnerable sector search. And there, um, I'll tell you guys a little bit more about that in a moment. In addition, we do require immunization records that would comply with what our clinical partners require for immunization to be a healthcare worker. And we do also want to ensure that you have good ergonomics and you're keeping your back healthy. So depending on your program will depend on whether you need transfer lifting and repositioning, client moving, or whether you would require object moving. And we also require you to do workplace hazardous management information system, um, again, so that we're keeping you in a safe environment when you're in not only our labs on campus, but also your clinical environment. A couple of important things to note is that we do require English language proficiency requirements for all of our programs. and to actually attain licensure in many of our programs and to work as a professional, they do have English language requirements. And so it has become a requirement to come into the program. Um, so you might wonder what first qualified, first admitted means. It basically means the first applicants that come in and meet all of the qualifications are the first ones that are offered the program seat. And so it's based on basically your admission date, if you have all of your documentation in to prove that you have what is required for the program. Once that program is filled up, we keep a wait list. And that wait list as well is dependent on the date of your application. So they're wait listed in the same order. 
And if we have somebody who chooses a different path before the program starts or declines their seat, we would go to that wait list and we would offer to the next person on the wait list. Once the program has started, about six weeks into the program, the our admission or enrollment services department would actually look at that waitlist. They would contact everybody that is on that waitlist and they would offer them the ability to remain on that waitlist. And to remain on that waitlist, all you have to do is pay your application fee again, but you get to keep your original date. And so you get to keep your, your line or your, your queue in the line. <clears throat> Our other programs, Combined Laboratory and X-ray Technology, our Medical Laboratory Technology and our MRT program also have, pardon me, not also, they have competitive entry. And so we have two phases to our competitive entry. You should be aware that it is only open from October 1st to February 15th annually. And within that timeline, it doesn't matter what time you apply in that timeline, you have to do certain components. So you would have to get in your, your application, um, you would have to get your transcripts submitted to SAS Polytech. In addition to that, you would have to do what we refer to as an essay of traits, an awareness questionnaire, and a situational assessment. The essay of traits is basically a essay that you would write of yourself saying what it is about you that would make you a good candidate, what makes you a good fit for that profession. Awareness questionnaire is really, really simple. It's a bunch of yes, no questions. And the situational assessment is done by a third party called Casper. And this is an additional cost outside of your application. It's about $45. And what it is, is a company that provides situations not related to the profession, just general everyday situations. And we look to see how you would respond to those types of situations. And um, you are ranked accordingly um, in that third party. Once phase one is complete, all that has to be complete by February 28th maximum. Um, we take the top two and a half number of people from phase one and we move them into phase two. In phase two, we look at three things only. We look at whether or not you have any post-secondary education. There's a few additional points that you can get for that. If you're in high school, please don't panic. We get lots of straight out of high school that actually get accepted into our programs. Um, you, we will look at your essay of traits, we will mark that, and you will get a score for that. And we will also look at your grading for your situational assessment. And based on those three criterion, we look at who it, you get ranked, and the top applicants would get offered a seat in the program. Um, I know that I am running out of time, so I'm going to very quickly just mention a couple of things here. Um, we do offer a new student orientation to applicants who are accepted into the program. There are a few people who apply to the program who choose to do some of our core classes through continuing education. It does cost slightly more to do some of our core classes like medical terminology, infection control, anatomy and physiology. However, it does give you a little bit of reprieve in the first few weeks of your program. FQFA is open all year. Competitive entry, as I mentioned, is only open October 1st to February 15th. There's lots of information on our website. So please, if you are interested in our programs, go and check it out. You should be aware that your clinical locations could be anywhere throughout Saskatchewan. Depending on the program that you apply for will depend on where our clinical placements are, but you can anticipate having to move for your clinical placement. The other thing that you should be aware of is dependent on your program, you are likely have, having to move between clinical placements in order to gain all of your competencies. Um, even if you're located in our MRT program, which is Regina or Saskatoon only, you are going to be moving between hospitals and clinics. So it's not like you can pick a place and be, you know, within walking distance throughout your entire practicum. That actually won't happen. And for some of our programs, um, 
like MLT, you're going to have a rural rotation and you're going to have um, alternate locations as well to go to. Um, we are nationally accredited and we do meet our national competency profiles and our provincial stakeholder needs. Um, you should be aware for those programs that require a licensure exam that is over and above your program tuition costs. They're pretty expensive. Most of them are around $1,000. Um, so you do want to budget accordingly. And I'm going to pause at that and turn it back to Michelle because I'm quite certain my 10 minutes are over. Um, I will just answer the one question about uh, that came from Madeline regarding the MRI technology. MRI is actually not offered through SAS Polytech. You do need to go outside of province to get that one. And um, just so that you're aware of that. Back to you, Michelle, thanks. All right, so thank you so much, Jody, for joining us and sharing that information. Oh, I hit the wrong button here. So I am going to introduce our next uh, speaker who is our first panelist from the industry joining us tonight. So Lonnie Naylor has been a nuclear medicine technologist on and off for over 20 years. She took her training in Calgary and has worked in Saskatoon most of her career. She's worked in all areas of nuke med and seen many changes, both in what is being imaged and how it is imaged. So please welcome Lonnie. Hi, I'm Lonnie. Let me just get my screen started here. I'm in nuclear medicine and nuclear medicine as, long, as well as all medical imaging, communication is very important. We are constantly talking with our patients, our coworkers, the nurses, the doctors. Uh, all medical imaging fields will work cooperatively as we all image different organs or the, image the organs in different ways. There's many studies that to get the information needed, there will be more than one type of medical imaging done. Nuclear medicine communication is extremely important because nobody knows what we do. <laughs> it's a, it's a, an, a way of imaging the physiologic part of the body or how the body is functioning. So when patients, friends and relatives ask, and you, they will ask, are you safe? Or am I going to glow once, I've given, once you've given this injection? That's because most people believe this is the nuclear part of nuclear medicine. The truth is most of our studies have no side effects unless you count boredom. The patient's imaging can take anywhere from two minutes up to two hours, depending on what we're taking pictures of. I promise the patient is not going to glow. Sometimes I tell them they will if their eyes are closed. In nuclear medicine, what it actually looks like is a lot of computers. To me, it's really cool. It allows me to look within the body and see how organs are functioning without having to cut. The pictures are not what you typically find as an example in your regular, te regular textbooks because they're imaging the function of the organs. Therefore, we have to do a lot of computer analysis. We do have cameras that allow us to take a CT as well as our nuclear medicine image and then we marry the two sets so that we have an, uh, an anatomy as well as physiology pictures. Uh, we have different cameras that allow us to do this in different ways. With this one, this is a PET CT camera. So the PET part of the camera is in the front and the CT portion is at the, at the back of it. So we do two, two types of pictures at the same time. This is a bone density unit. In this one, we measure to see how strong people's bones are to give them an estimate of if they walk out this winter and slip on the ice, whether or not their, their tendency will be to break a bone. This one is a regular nuclear medicine camera. It's the nuclear medicine head on, on this side, so that detects the radioactivity. And then we've got a CT at the back that allows us to take a CT as well. And then this one is just a specialized cardiac camera that allows us to do imaging of the cardiac, of the, car, of the heart. So what, is, what do we do in nuclear medicine? Well, what we are dealing with is open radioactivity. What we do is we label drugs with radioactivity. So it's a liquid that we're labeling the drugs with, and we can label different types of drugs, 
different drugs go to different areas of the body. So we inject these radioactive pharmaceuticals and then we are, they're used by different organs. So then we take pictures of those organs. So our cameras are able to detect that radioactivity and convert it into a picture. There are many different types of imaging used in nuclear medicine. There's planar and dynamic imaging, which means it's just one field, a flat picture like you're used to seeing. Dynamic means we'll take pictures of as the blood is flowing, like if we were taking pictures to see where there's an, if there's infection in bone, if we're taking a picture of the heart, we can take pictures of the heart as it's actually beating. Uh, we do SPECT imaging, which is one where the camera rotates around and we usually have a CT camera as well as the nuclear medicine camera. So we can combine those two sets of pictures and it makes it much easier for the doctors to read. We have radiopharmacy, which is where we label the, the radioactive drugs. PET-CT, which is newer part of nuclear medicine and is extremely sensitive in a lot of different types of cancer imaging. We have bone density where the x-rays are used to determine the strength of the bones. A typical day in nuclear medicine, you interview and prepare patients for their scans. You inject or administer the radiopharmaceuticals. Quite often then there's a time period where the patient has to wait so that it be, can be concentrated by the organ that we're looking at. And then you properly position the patient and scan them. And like I said, the scan can take anywhere from two minutes to two hours. You analyze and process those scans. And quite often, and it's leaning more and more towards it, we are administering more therapeutic treatments with the uh, labeling of antibodies and things like that. It can be a much better uh, treatment for cancer. So some of the nuclear medicine studies we do. On this one, this is a brain scan. Uh, this is a normal brain scan. So we expect to see uptake. And what we're trying to do is see if we can find the center of um, seizures. So the center of their epilepsy. So we take a set a picture before they have a seizure. We take a picture during their seizure and we try and find the difference. And here is the center of his, his seizures, which different areas of the brain react to drugs different ways. So this allows the doctors to figure out a better treatment plan for the patient. This is a renal scan. So we inject radioactivity and take pictures as soon as we start injecting and watch the flow. So what we do is we watch to see the kidneys fill up. So here's the kidneys here. We watch them fill up and then the graph shows you how quickly the kidney fills up. This is the, the background of the aorta emptying. And then we inject Lasix to see how quickly the kidney is empty. This kidney is blocked. That's why that line doesn't go down. This one comes up and goes down. That means that kidney is draining. We do bone scans. Bone scans, really cool. We inject a phosphate. Phosphates are absorbed by bones, same as calcium. Bones are a living tissue. So they're constantly remodeling. And what we're doing is looking for areas where remodeling, we don't expect to see it. This is a child. So you can see they still have active growth plates on, a, on the ends of all their long bones. If you have a child that, or somebody that downhill skis competitively or plays a lot of hockey, quite often we'll see a shadow on the front of their legs. This stuff is so sensitive. We can see where their ski boot rubs or their skate rubs on their leg. This patient, unfortunately, is an adult. And this is metastases. So the bone is growing faster because the cancer is growing in those areas. So this is all metastases or cancer that has spread to that area of the body on this patient. In PET CT, we see a good day, bad day. Quite often a patient will come in into, we had one patient went into CT. They passed out after a car accident. They went into CT and they thought they saw something in their chest. So they came to PET and they had um, lymphoma. So this is at the very beginning, they came in and this is their pre-diagnosis again, it helps the doctors to decide what type of therapy they're gonna have, how aggressive their therapy has to be. And then this is the same patient after their therapy was finished. This is where we injected, this is the central line that we injected in, but you can see that it's all cleared out. The compound that we give is, um, eliminated through the kidneys. So we've got highlighted the kidney and the bladder and that's just urine. That's, that's something we would normally find. We expect that. So a nuclear medicine technologist, you need to be a people person. You're dealing with nurses, doctors, your coworkers, patients, and the patients are sick. So they're never, not always the most happy people to be around, but they're always very, very thankful. Um, most of our, our job is patient care. 
There's 20% of it, I would say, is, about, is lab work, and that's the manufacture of drugs. We do do some tests that involve blood samples, uh, but really, it's, it's not a lot of mess. Uh, you need to be able to work independently or be a part and be a part of a team. Uh, quite often in the camera room, you are by yourself working with your patient, but that patient quite often has to be coordinated to go several different places. So you have to be able to do that. It's a Monday to Friday job, no shift work. Uh, we do weekend call um, nine to five on the weekends, uh, rotates through our staff members. We take call probably about four times a year. Uh, there's very few on-call shifts. And again, like I said, it's a nine to five, so it's not bad. The studies, it's always different studies. It's never, you don't do the same thing every day, which is nice. We rotate through the different camera rooms so you never truly get bored. We do not do a lot of trauma situations. Uh, most of our patients are what we call walkie talkies. They're mostly outpatients, they walk in. It's not, they, we don't have a problem. But we do do some very sick patients. So we can have everything from babies to elderly. We can have, like I say, walkie talkies that walk in to people that are being kept alive to see if we can use their organs for donation. Um, some of the cons in nuclear medicine is that it's a very small environment. You only can work in larger centers. Not every hospital has a nuclear medicine department. There's a potential for needle stick because almost every study we do requires an injection. You're exposed to illness and sick patients. You're dealing with a variety of sick patients. And like I said, they can be kind of grumpy at time. Uh, the job prospects in Saskatchewan, there's only two cities, Saskatoon and Regina. Um, all, both cities, but all of the hospitals have a nuclear medicine department in them. Um, so there is, there is 22 techs in Saskatoon. I'm not sure how many they have in Regina. And we rotate through all three hospitals here in Saskatoon. Uh, in the other provinces, there is private clinics as well as hospital work. So there's a little bit more. We do, uh, there are students accepted at SATE from Saskatchewan, Alberta, and Manitoba, though. So it, it, there is competition there. So SATE is where we take this. It's Southern Alberta Institute of Technology in Calgary. There is two seats for Saskatchewan, in, or pardon me, four seats for Saskatchewan in there, two students from Regina, two students from Saskatoon. What they do is they go to Calgary and take the didactic or the book portion of it, and then they come back to Saskatoon and Regina and do the practical phase. The admission requirements are on the SAIT website. It's a two-year course, and like I say, the first year at SAIT, the second year is a practicum. The costs are about $12,000 for books and living expenses, and it's a small classroom. There's usually about 25, 30 students. It's a very intense workload though, because you've only got a year in the school. And then during your practical phase, there's a class day that is online so that no matter where you are, you're still getting together with your class. Nuclear medicine, you have to write a uh, national exam and that's about $800 and it's about $400. For, pardon me, four hour exam, it's about $800. If you have any questions, there's my address. I'm Lonnie Naylor and I'm a nuclear thingy doer. Lonnie, we do have one question. Um, okay. Someone, someone asked, is the part that was black where the stuff was injected or is that where the cancer was? The, on these images, the black is where the cancer was. The injection site, usually because we inject it in a vein, you don't see it. Unless right. we make a mistake. All right. Well, thank you so much, Lonnie, for joining us and sharing that information with us tonight. Um, and once again, if you do have a question for any of the panelists, please make sure and put it in the Q&A. And if we don't answer it right away, we do have time at the end set aside to answer questions. So let's continue on with our panelists. So next up, we have Rick Novikovsky. He is a medical radio radiological technologist that has been working in the field for over 20 years. After taking his training in Saskatchewan, he started his career at RUH in Saskatoon, first as a general x-ray and now currently as a vascular x-ray tech. Rick is very passionate about his job and continues to try and share that passion with patients, other staff, and potential new students. The medical radiological technologist profession is an exciting and rewarding field to enter into. So please welcome Rick.
Hey guys, hope everybody's doing okay, staying awake out there. This is a weird uh, venue in a weird year, a couple of years for sure, to be honest with all this stuff going on. Um, I'm a Vassar X-ray tech. I started out as a general X-ray tech. Uh, you know, I absolutely love my job. You will talk to all these people here tonight or listen to us all talk and we will tell you different factions of our job and different factions of healthcare. Uh, remember, we're all one big team. We are a team of healthcare workers trying our best to help patients out to get better from what they're ailing from or to figure out what's going on with them so that they can do surgery, treatments, and the like. Uh, I myself, we take pictures. That's what we do. Um, while we take pictures, we try and figure out what is going on with the, the patients here. So I'm gonna go a little old school. I'm sorry for my technical abilities, but we have the x-ray machine there in the tiny screen there. Hopefully that was bigger, but anyway. Uh, so we have to use a radiation source to get the pictures and the patient goes on the table here uh, just to kind of go. You can imagine if someone was in a car accident, they would be too unwell to get on the table themselves. So we have to move them onto the table. The table kind of floats and moves and then we can move the patient to different positions to take all the different x-rays we need to see. Uh, those x-rays all go into a computer generated system called PAX. And then we can send all that information to everybody in the province in a matter of seconds to have the doctor make a decision of what's going on. It could be they need surgery. It could be they need a neck brace. It could be that they're A-OK. -okay. It could be lots of things that we can determine from our x-rays. And again, we can speed that up with the computer system and know as quick as we can to get them where they need to go the next step. So let's just get right into the pictures. This is a basic hand x-ray, uh, nothing seen there. Somebody hurt their hand doing something. And this next one, thumbs down, uh, dislocated thumb. So you can see here why x-ray is interesting and fascinating because we can actually see the different things. The thumb is out of joint here and you can see why it is a problem. This person will go down to emerge get some medicines, get it reset, and then come back for another x-ray afterwards it was done. Uh, regular spine x-ray, you can see all the vertebrae there in the middle of the screen. The lungs are kind of blackened out in this picture because we're using more x-ray to see the spine. Uh, as an x-ray tech, you kind of learn that different pot thickness body parts and, and things need more or less x-ray, and you kind of learn how to use those Techniques are called to try and get the best pictures for the doctors to make the best diagnosis. As an x-ray tech, we don't diagnose people. We learn lots and we have definitely knowledge in pathologies and things that are there, but it is the doctor that makes the ultimate decision on the x-rays and also relays that information to patients. Once we know what's going on with the patients, we can be a liaison between the doctor and the patients about uh, some things and upcoming procedures that they may have or things that are going on with them. But again, the results of tests and things are up to the doctors. Here we have a scoliosis, a, a extremely curved spine. Uh, we need to know what's going on here. Sometimes this would require surgery, sometimes a corrective brace, sometimes it wouldn't cause anything at all. And actually most people, you know, we looked at 10 people, three of them would probably have scoliosis without even knowing it. This is an x-ray of the top of our neck. Uh, right there, you can see if we break this bone in our body, the higher up in our neck that we are looking at, the more that we have that is uh, our breathing uh, functions, our respiratory, our heart rate, and that kind of stuff. So the top of our neck is very important. Uh, this person you know, would have been in a car accident maybe, and they can't move. So we have to open their jaw, just kind of see the top of the neck there, seen through the mouth. This is someone who did in fact break their neck. There is a surgical planted device there where people uh, went to the OR. We've put them on the OR table. The x-ray tech then watches with the surgeon uh, to make sure that those little screws and plates are in fact in the bone. There is a little cage-like device in the middle there that's protecting the spinal cord. 
Uh, and as long as the spinal cord wasn't damaged in this uh, accident, the person could, in fact, be still walking and stuff. Uh, but if the spinal cord was damaged, they could, in fact, be paralyzed. And we would have to work with that as text there. This is your standard hanging Christmas lights x-ray. Uh, Christmas tree uh, standing up on top of the house fell and broke your heel. Uh, you wouldn't be able to walk for a while. Maybe a cast to fix that up here for the next one. This is a dislocated shoulder. It's hard to see from these pictures, but the shoulder is in fact at a joint. And in the first picture, we see it doesn't look that bad, but as we move along to the next pictures, well, that's why we do more than one picture. It is in fact out of joint and would cause a lot of pain, maybe even seizure-like activity, even for the toughest of guys or toughest of girls. Uh, we'd have to get that back into place for them. This is a coin swallowed by a little one. Uh, big thing, you know, little kids putting things in their mouth. Uh, the x-ray allows the doctor to see where it is and if they have to do surgery or if they can do a blind sweep and get that out and emerge, that kind of thing, it will tell them if it's in or behind them. So it's really important that we take good pictures here to help everybody out. Uh, an x-ray, this is an x-ray of a face, a skull. Uh, you can see the facial piercings that we didn't remove there. But we also see at the top of the x-ray, there's some sinusitis, it's called, uh, where there is an infection in the sinuses, would require medication there to treat that and then get that better for them. And unfortunately, x-ray gets pretty real sometimes. We, we see some really bad things. This is, in fact, a nail gun incident that the nail is lodged inside the head. Uh, unfortunately, some of these bad things do happen to people but our training takes over and helps them to get better. And we want them to have this removed and live the best life they can live and hopefully recover from their injuries. This again, uh, a real bad incident, a knife inside their head and they were totally alive and they were totally fine, except they had a knife there uh, magically or luckily they did not have any major damage to any of the major structures of body parts in the, the head. It was amazing. Here's from a side view again, proving that that is actually inside the skull. Typical knee x-ray and then a knee replacement, very common, things that we do all the time here. Uh, you can see here, this is a kneecap x-ray showing that there's a generative disease in the joint. There's a wide space here and not so much of a wide space on the other side. Might need surgery to fix that one. Um, this is an x-ray of a broken leg. It's actually broken in two spots. Again, that's the neat part of x-ray. You can actually physically see where those two broken parts are. And again, at the top of the knee there, there is the other bone that's broken as well. Uh, a simple surgery where again, we'd have to be an x-ray tech in the room and we drive a portable x-ray machine that the doctor can physically screw the bone out, drill that broken bone out, and then put it back into place and put a large rod in there to physically hold it there. And they would need x-ray in the OR to help with that. Um, general chest x-ray, again, 80% of our work, lots of things happen here in the chest. We can see fevers, we can see COVID, big one these days. A simple x-ray would show COVID, and if you've ever seen them, it is unbelievable what people are having to live with to just struggle and breathe. COVID is a very serious uh, x-ray, one of the very most serious things I've ever seen in my 20 years of training, for sure. Uh, pacemaker here. Um, then you can see here on the left, this is actually fluid in someone's lung. Uh, maybe post heart surgery or an infection, we would take that person vascular and drain that fluid out if it was there. So then x-ray becomes more uh, as a treatment instead of just diagnostic. So some of our, our areas, we can actually treat things and get them better. On the right here, we have a cancer. You can see the tumor clearly in the front of the chest. Sadly, this is probably an inoperable tumor and sadly would probably not do very well or for very long with that kind of tumor there.
I could go on and on about x-rays all night. And if you have more questions, I could definitely uh, feel free to ask them. Some of the pros for x-ray we have, for some people, shift work isn't a plus, but for some people it is. You can work around your kids. There's days, evenings, nights uh, that work around people's schedules. I myself work 8 to 4.30 right now and work call. Um, when you go into x-ray, you can springboard into other areas like CT, uh, in my case, vascular, MRI. You can do extra training and go back into being an MRI tech. You can go back into being ultrasound. There's business opportunities. There's advantages in management and all that stuff. So it's really a springboard into other things. And once you get in it, you can kind of see so many amazing possibilities and you'll see different things that pull you to different ways and find where your career or path takes you. It's uh, an amazing field to get into. Um, some of the cons, we, you know, we do heavy lifting with our patients. They can't move into positions and we, we do have to turn them or turn the body parts to get the pictures we need. Uh, you're dealing with sick, dead, dying people. You're dealing with injured, uh, broken people. They may have had trauma, blood, gore, other things there. Again, your training takes over where that stuff doesn't bother you. You rely on your empathy and your sympathy and your training to get the pictures done, get the person on their way, and hopefully have them heal and get better. Or maybe it's simple patient care. Uh, big time, big time part of all of our jobs is patient care, where you spend most of your time making them comfortable, maybe making them laugh during a difficult procedure, taking the edge off those things, uh, and still doing your job and getting the work done so that they are ultimately going to get better from what you're helping them do. Um, I think I'm getting close to my time limit here. Um, but if you have any more questions, you can reach me at r.nova at sastel.net uh, and either email me or message Michelle here and we can pass them on to me and I'll get back to you as soon as I can and help you any way I can to reach your career path and hopefully enjoy a long, illustrious career uh, in the healthcare world. It never seems to be ending. We always have people coming to see us. There will always be a need for healthcare workers. Thank you so much, Rick, for sharing your presentation with us and sharing those images as well. It really helps for us to understand um, what it in, all entails in your job. So moving on, we have our next panelist. So we have Maureen Prowl. So after high school, Maureen received, well, I don't know if my screen is sharing properly. I'm just going to do that again. Share screen. Okay. All right, sorry about that. So after um, high school, Maureen received a Bachelor of Arts degree in sociology and worked as a trustee counselor prior to pursuing her childhood goal of working in a medical field. Graduating from the former Kelsey Institute in Medical Radiation Technology in 1986, she soon knew her path was to study ultrasound. She was, uh, she was asked to set up a new private x-ray clinic where she worked as a solo technician. A year later, she was accepted to the ultrasound post-diploma de program through the Royal University Hospital and Mohawk McMaster in Hamilton, graduating with honors. Maureen's first job was as a diagnostic medical sonographer, um, was with Grieg and Associates in Vancouver, returning to Saskatoon to work at St. Paul's Hospital in 1989. She became an ultrasound supervisor at St. Paul's in 2002, then was a working supervisor at Saskatoon City Hospital later that year. Maureen's worked for the Saskatoon Health Region as the Saskatchewan Health Authority, scanning, teaching, and working standby shift for 32 years. On days off, she has worked for the Montreal Cardiology Institute, conducting a teaching ultrasound research protocols to stenographers in Boston, New York, Sarasota, Fort Lauderdale, and Montreal. Maureen has sat on the advisory committee for medical imaging for the College of Physi Physicians and Surgeons of Saskatchewan since 2008, chairs the committee for responsible use of ultrasound for the Saskatchewan Association of Di Diagnostic Medical Stenographers, 
and is an active proponent for the licensure of sonographers in Saskatchewan. She enjoys answering questions for people deciding if a career in diagnostic medical sonography is a good fit for them. So please welcome Maureen. And we have a few um, photos that we are going to share throughout her presentation. Well, welcome everyone. Um, I am happy to be invited to present um, any information I can about ultrasound so that you can um, find that it, it, it might be a fit for you, that it might speak to you. Um, like many people whose first introduction to ultrasound is their first ultrasound scan, this was my experience. I watched the sonographer and the role that she had and I, I just felt it was something special. I had always been interested in the medical field. Years ago, I was ac accepted as a Saskatchewan ultrasound student. And at that time, um, the didactic was given at Mohawk in Hamilton and the clinic, my clinic, clinical was at Royal University Hospital. Um, mine was a post-diploma program. Um, and my first diploma was an X-ray, which led me uh, further on into ultrasound. Some of the pictures that you'll see on the screen are some ultrasound pictures. This is um, one of the more classic. It's, uh, you know, the profile of the fetal face in utero. Um, all the medical imaging modalities have a wide variety of overlapping. Um, you're looking at a kidney image here now. Um, all of our professions basically um, require good communication and caring about other people. Um, and they all require people to be um, people oriented. We, we go into these professions because we want to help people. So you absolutely must be a talkative, somewhat talkative and a people person. There are differences. The different type of energy that is used in ultrasound is a significant difference. We use high frequency sound waves. It's called non-ionizing radiation, but it still is a form of energy that is to be respected. The image that you'll see um, that we just finished was a normal gallbladder and then a gallbladder with a gallstone. The picture that you see now, that, that's great. There's a gallstone and you'll see it's an echogenic or a bright um, noticeable mass. The next picture that um, Michelle is going to toggle through, this is um, showing an ultrasound machine that goes up to the operating, it's kind of exciting stuff. The ultrasound, as you can see, um, requires the sonographer to use a, a handheld, we'll call it a camera or a transducer, and it's placed on the patient's skin. So we have to sit or stand at the patient's side for the entire length of the exam, moving the camera, to where we need to examine. The sound waves from the transducer enter the patient, bounce back, put a dot on the screen, and all the dots together make up the image. The image is live, like a movie. We scan, we stop to where we notice something, and we then take a picture there. Um, here we have three sonographers really enjoying their day um, with a variety of transducers and you can see the ultrasound machine in the background and as you can see it's a very enjoyable profession. Sonographer does have to know where to look. We have to know how to interrogate each organ and specifically we do need to know what is normal and abnormal, capture this information on still images and relay that to the interpreting physician. This picture is of a liver. This is definitely not normal. And it's obvious that there are multiple, um, what we call equigenic or bright lesions within uh, this liver. And this is metastatic disease, or this is cancer that has started somewhere else and spread to the liver. So where do sonographers work? We, we primarily work in places like clinics where people are outpatients and come for their exam, or we can work in hospitals 
where people do tend to be somewhat sicker and where the sonographers perform um, specific exams that aren't allowed to be done in a clinic. Um, this image that you're seeing now is a transvaginal ultrasound um, showing a very small fetus. This is this fetus is probably around uh, seven weeks, and um, the best way to interrogate something that's small is closer to it. So the camera was positioned in the patient's vagina. So in a typical day, how many people do I scan? Well, it, in a hospital, we scan, I would say, approximately 10 patients, sometimes more, sometimes less, depending on how busy our emergency department and other departments, uh, other wards, how busy and what the need is. During the pandemic, of course, we've been much busier. And yes, ultrasound does have a role in patients with COVID because there is a, um, a definite correlation with um, vasculitis and other um, blood vessel type um, abnormalities. We scan a lot of legs, people have pulmonary emboli, people have um, blood clots. Um, and we do sometimes scan chests looking for fluid in patients um, with with COVID-19. So what do I do now? Well, my current position is uh, an ultrasound working supervisor. I supervise the ultrasound staff uh, that are scheduled to work with me on a daily basis. But I also work on the floor as a sonographer and I'm thrilled that I still get to do this. Um, I am an instructor of students when they come through our department during their practicum. And um, the scanning or the testing part of my job basically is like any sonographer. I receive the patient, I prepare them for the exam and I explain to them what I'm about to do. And I proceed with running the ultrasound machine with my left hand and I use the handheld transducer with my right hand. Um, I examine the patient. So you can see this um, sonographer here is scanning a very small baby and with the left hand is um, manipulating the machine with the buttons and um, different annotations and then with the other hand um, is the tiny in this case handheld transducer this is a, a, a challenging exam because you can't ask the the baby to take a deep breath in and hold it something like that's just not going to work so you've got to be swift and um, you've got to recognize um, what you need to take a picture of and, and be quick and, and snap it. Um, we uh, sonographers take images to document what we see. We use our knowledge to determine what is normal or abnormal. And we do have the responsibility to answer the question that the ordering doctor is asking about the scan. This is um, a male testes that you're seeing and uh, it's called microlithiasis where there uh, are lots of tiny calcifications within that testicle. Um, after I finish the test, uh, I go to a computer and I go over all my images and we fill out, it's called a sonographer's observation sheet. Um, because I was the one who saw all the live images and I made the decision on which image is going to be captured and sent to the radiologist, I'm going to write up my, um, my analysis of what I have observed and put a differential on our observation sheet. And then I discuss my findings with the radiologist and the radiologist can question me at that time. Um, well, what about this? Um, what do you think this little black thing is over there, Maureen? And it's my responsibility to back up the pictures that I have taken um, with my um, observation and my discussion. This is uh, a female endometrium and you notice that we measure things. We measure things to show, are they normal, are they abnormal? And I'm measuring an endometrium here. So I better, um, I know what my normal is and then I will be able to put on my observation sheet whether it was normal or abnormal. Um, other things that I do um, in my job involves staff relationships, um, 
managing phone calls, booking ultrasound appointments, um, other office work, uh, ordering supplies, meetings, giving presentations regarding ultrasound. Um, but really, it, it's, it's a highlight of my day to work with um, the physicians to find out what is going on with the patient, if there's anything at all, and um, so that the patient can be managed as, as best as possible. Here's someone who's doing a carotid ultrasound, that is the carotid artery in the neck. Sonographers work, work closely as other um, medical imaging professionals do with radiologists, obstetricians, cardiologists, internists, nephrologists, and surgeons, lots of specialists. We report directly to the specialist um, and discuss our findings. We, we must know the anatomy, we must understand pathologies and prove what is happening. Um, ultrasound is kind of an operator dependent modality as you can see because we hold the camera ourselves. Unfortunately, if we don't see the tumor or if we miss that gallstone that you saw in one images or a necrotic area, for example, we, wouldn't know, we don't recognize it, we don't image it. And then unfortunately the report will not reflect that that pathology is there even though it is. So patient management can be significantly affected and sonographers are taught and they accept this responsibility. So what are the pros and cons about my job? Well, my favorite part of my job is how difficult it can be, how challenging it is. I love that we're trained and that we have a re responsibility so that we can help the patient. I also have to admit that I love that I'm in control of the examination. I enjoy working with people and patients, and I'm challenged to form this professional relationship with them in a very short period of time. And so that they will lie there and they will allow me to conduct their exam in this close proximity and that I can help them find the answers. What's my least favorite part? Well, it's kind of tough to say I've been doing this for so long. If, it, if, it, if I had lots of problems with it, I probably wouldn't still be doing it. There really isn't much that I don't like. I must say it is hard to conduct an exam when I find something like diffuse cancer throughout a patient, knowing that the outcome likely will be poor, or I find it difficult and emotional when we find the, the, the death or the demise of a, of, a, of a baby. It does take a lot to learn to balance your professionalism, to not reveal the results of the exam because the patient can see your face and yet be sensitive and understanding to that worried patient. But this is capable of being achieved with training and expertise. I can't say it's horrible. S still, we feel we are helping the patient through this difficult time. Other challenges, well, like I say, the education experience, it gives us the capability of knowing potential consequences for the person's life. Um, we do have to have a poker face. Patients often ask, what do you see? Is it normal? And we have to show um, what, what, uh, that we care, but we are not allowed to give them the results. We talk to the physician about it and the physician gives the report. Um, I do find it challenging that very few people really understand what sonographers do. Many people think we just rub gel on the skin and take pictures, but we do have other components requiring skills of interpretation and situational management. Um, it is important that people who go into ultrasound know that we don't just put transducers on people's skins. They are positioned often medically appropriately in body orifices. We do transvaginal, we're involved in transrectal, and we are involved in scrotal ultrasounds. Um, so people who go into ultrasound must be professionally, uh, uh, comfortable, sorry, with being professionally intimate with their patient. We do work days, evenings, weekends, and call shifts. So anytime, um, we like x-ray, we are used to guide many biopsies and drainages. So a sonographer must be comfortable around blood and body fluids, um, just like lots of other modalities. Um, 
It's the fact that many sonographers have uh, MSK or musculoskeletal injuries over time because we're scanning many hours in the day, sometimes shoulder issues, wrists, elbow injuries, they come from years of scanning. Um, I do believe that it's super challenging, but I do believe that anything in life that's really worthwhile, it doesn't come easy. Um, it is important for me to make a point that currently there is no training program for ultrasound in Saskatchewan that's based out of here. We do have practicums here in Saskatchewan, but the Saskatchewan government has purchased seats at SAIT, much like the nuclear medicine and um, MRI programs. But um, so a sonographer or someone wanting to become a sonographer and have their practicums in Saskatchewan would apply to SAIT, that is in Calgary. Um, their practicums could be done in you know, Saskatoon, Regina, say Yorkton, North Battleford, Prince Albert, and um, they would be at hospitals or clinics. Now the state program is only 26 months and it is a direct entry program. So people can uh, apply after high school, but definitely um, life experience or post-secondary education um, doesn't hurt at all. There are registry programs uh, similar to all the other um, technologies at the conclusion of the program. So um, probably the best way to get a hold of me is um, my through my email with the Saskatchewan Health Authority, um, and that can be uh, given to you if you ask Michelle. Thanks for listening, and I'd love to talk to anybody about ultrasound. Thanks, everyone. All right. Well, thank you so much, Maureen, for sharing that information and sharing those images with us. Um, so we are going to welcome our final panelist of the evening. And so we have Brittany Ferguson joining us. She grew up in Prince Albert and after high school, she did two years of university and decided it was not for her. She then decided to take the medical laboratory technologist course at SAS Polytech in Saskatoon, previously known as SIAS Kelsey. Brittany started her career at the Victoria Hospital in Prince Albert and is still there today. She's been a medical laboratory technologist for 10 years and works in automated at the laboratory um, consisting of hematology, coagulation, transfusion, medical, and chemistry. Brittany has been married for seven years and has a six-year-old son and a four-year-old daughter. So please welcome Brittany. Hi. Um, so I'm Brittany. I've been a lab tech for 10 years and I do work at the in Prince Albert at the Victoria Hospital Lab. Um, as it was said, I grew up in Prince Albert and after high school, I did what most people do. I attended the University of Saskatchewan. Um, I completed two years there and decided that I didn't really like it as there was no clear career path for me. I did a quick Google search and came across the Medical Laboratory Technologist Program. Um, I completed a job shadow to better understand the career and was accepted into the program at SIAS Kelsey Campus in Saskatoon, now known as SAS Polytech. Um, I did my clinical practicum in Saskatoon, and then I graduated from the program in 2011. Um, I started out as part-time at Victoria Hospital, but was able to get a full-time position within a few months of working. Um, I do work in automated, so chemistry, hematology, and transfusion medicine. Um, it's Prince Albert was a great place to start my career since I'm able to practice three out of the five main areas of lab, the other two being microbiology and histology. Um, in most big cities, you only are able to work in one area of the lab and specialize in that area. So working in a small rural area or yeah, is great for diversity and experience. Um, working in the lab has allowed me to do a lot of different things. I was able to travel to Mississauga, Ontario to learn and train for a new chemistry analyzer. Um, I learned the analyzer and became a super user and was then responsible for validating the new analyzer, running correlations and training coworkers on how to run the new machine. It was a great experience and I really hope to be able to do it in the future. Um, these past years, I've become more involved with the lab. 
I'm on our local transfusion medicine committee, which recently completed a new protocol for mass hemorrhaging. The mass hemorrhage protocol has helped immensely in bringing the whole hospital together to work as a team, and also it helps in the patient outcome. Since I am on the transfusion medicine committee for our hospital, I was able to take a transfusion medicine course, the CSMLS, which is our regulatory body, the Canadian National Professional Body, which has helped in procedures and standards. Um, recently, we're doing chemistry reagent switchover. So I'm in charge of doing all the validations, linearity and cross reactivity with that. Um, I just completed the first reagent changeover and myself and another coworker will be doing the rest in the new year. Um, I also recently became a clinical uh, clinical preceptor liaison for the new for the MLT students that are doing their practicum in Prince Albert. And I'm very excited to help guide them in their new career as a medical lab tech. Um, I plan to continue to work in Prince Albert in the automated department and eventually aspire to become a tech too, which comes with more responsibility and a greater role in the lab. Um, being a medical laboratory technologist has been such a rewarding career so far. <laughs> um, by providing critical results to the physicians and other healthcare professionals, I am able to make a difference in patients' lives, whether it's aiding in diagno diagnosis, um, providing results for continuous treatment, or providing compatible blood and blood components in critical care or continuous therapy. Although patients do not always know what I do and what I do, the lab provides a critical step in patient care behind the scenes. Lab is not usually recognized or well known to the public, but I know that what I do makes an impact in people's lives. COVID has really brought the lab into more of a bigger picture, but it's such a small picture of the lab. There's so much more to it. <laughs> um, I promise that if you decide to become a lab tech, you will constantly have to explain to your friends and family what you do, um, because the only thing that they will know is that, oh, so you're the person that takes blood. <laughs> Although that is something you will do. Um, medical lab tech is so much more than that. You analyze blood and body fluids, you can isolate and grow organisms, and you can cut up tissue from the body and organs, embed it and stain it. And you provide compatible blood for patients because contrary to popular belief, there's more to cross-matching a unit of blood for someone than just everyone gets all negative. <laughs> there's way more things for that. Um, Due to immense shortages in lab because of retirements and a low intake from previous years, they only took 20 students before, um, medical lab techs are in very high demand, especially in rural areas. Um, if you decide to embark on the wonderfully rewarding career path as a medical lab tech, I personally would strongly recommend looking at a rural site to start your career. As I said before, um, Prince Albert has been great in the fact that I'm able to practice three out of the five disciplines of lab. And by taking a few years and working as many areas as you can, you can easily discover what part of the lab is best for you, since there's a lot of different areas, <laughs> or five, I guess, main areas. Um, if you're working more, you can kind of decide what area you like the best. I've learned that I have like automated, so I really enjoy it transfusion medicines, chemistry, and hematology. Um, if I ever decided I wanted to switch, I could always go to, it's called the diagnostic area in my laboratory, which is um, histology and microbiology. But I'm happy where I am. Um, you, There's lots of different hours. I personally work shift work, so it's a 24 hour lab. So all, all days, <laughs> all nights and evenings, they're all of that. Um, some labs do only work nine to five hours um, or Monday to Friday, but for the most part, lab is a 24 hour thing and you continuously work. Um, every day is different in the lab and every day is very rewarding in its own way. Um, I really love my job and I'm very fortunate about, to have found a career that I really love and I hope you guys all do too. Um, my presentation isn't as long as everyone else's or maybe as informative. It's my first time, so hopefully next time I will <laughs> present more. But for now, that's all I have. But yeah, LabTech is great. So I encourage you all to look into it more. <laughs> Thank you so much, Brittany, for your presentation. And I think it was very informative. So do not discredit um, the information that you shared. 
So we do have a few questions in the Q&A. And so if anyone does have any last minute questions, I'll encourage you to get those entered. And I'm going to invite all of our panelists to come back on screen and we'll answer those questions for you. So I know Tammy wanted to um, make a comment. So I'll invite her to um, speak. Thanks, Michelle. I just wanted to uh, carry on with what Brittany was saying about with our rural lab. So right now we partnered with SAS Poly with recruitment of the MLT students. So um, with partnership with the lab, we also have incentives. So if you decide to become an MLT at this time right now, we have incentives. If you go to anywhere else other than Saskatoon and Regina, um, there's an opportunity and I and it will be like so for 2021 recruitment so it may change when you're ready for to uh, pursue a, a career in MLT so up right now folks are um, offered pardon me up to ten thousand dollars to go to a rural facility to work in work as an MLT so um, we have a relocation so our relocation actually is for um, any of our professions uh, that are hard to recruit um, within scope positions that's up to three thousand dollars that uh, employees are able to um, submit the receipts to be reimbursed for but with the labs with MLT we also have a seven thousand dollar incentive so like Brittany said like rural has so much to offer folks and we really would like to bring a little bit of spotlight to them because um, there is more and I think Brittany you could speak a little bit more to the work that you do as well right I think it's, it's like more all-encompassing of your roles so you're not just in one like hematology or chemistry sometimes you get to to experience all of it so um, and I know too sorry I have to give a plug because I am on MLT recruitment um, we are looking at the current right now so there's huge opportunities for work um, in Swift Current as much as all of our role, but right now our Swift Current uh, partners are, are really looking for folks uh, with, for MLTs. Sorry, Brittany, I seen you come off mute. So I wanted, maybe if you wanted to add to what your day looks like. The what, sorry? I didn't Just hear that you. When you're working in rural, that it is a little bit more all encompassing of Oh. Of not just working sometimes just with hematology or chemistry or transfusions, you know, you're, you're, you're doing it all because it's rural and there's one lab, right? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's really, it helps you. It's better for your, I personally believe it's better for your career, at least at the beginning, for sure, just because, yeah, you get to do the three different departments. Um, and then you kind of see the correlation. So you can see a patient that came in and you can see what their hemoglobin is. And then you're like, okay, yeah, he'll probably need a transfusion. So then you go into blood bank and you get that ready. And then there's the, all the other aspects. So it's really neat to see how it all correlates and comes together. Whereas in the big cities, you get one area and that's, that's what you do and you specialize in it, but that's like the only area. So if you ever tried, wanted to go somewhere else, you're kind of relearning it again. Whereas the rural sites give you such a good opportunity for growth, <laughs> I think. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you both for adding that because I know um, we do have students from across the province um, viewing this. So that might be a little bit of incentive for them. So we did have two questions who, that were asked earlier on and um, Jody had said that she would answer them. So the first one is, what is CRC and VSS? So, so a CRC and a VSS is a criminal record check and a vulnerable sector search. So I used the full term when I was talking. Um, however, I had the abbreviation on the slide that you guys would have been seeing. So. Um, we do require criminal record check and vulnerable sector search because you will be working in healthcare and you will be working with a vulnerable sector of the society. And so we do need to make sure that that is clear and our clinical partners will accept you into their placements. Um, one of the other questions that was asked when Jody was presenting, so I assume it was for her, um, is what did the why mean in the chart? So in the chart that I was presenting, anywhere that you saw a Y meant that, yes, it is a requirement. So uh, again, just something very simple that you can go back and refer to. And this question, I believe, is for Lonnie. They asked, do you have fish in the background? 
Yes. <laughs> My, we have a lot of fish tanks in this house. This one is the sulfur head. So they're a cichlid. But yes, it's a fish tank. Awesome. Well, thank you. And thank you to um, the participants for asking questions throughout the presentation. And thank you again to the panelists for joining us. It was great to have you here. It's great to hear your experiences and hear about your career path. And especially, um, I really liked when Brittany said that for people will continually to ask you what you do. And I think that that's so true with so many careers out there is people don't always understand. So we're so fortunate to host events like this that expose students to different careers. So thank you all for joining us. And before I have... Um, all the participants sign off. I just have a few things I want to go over. So once again, thank you to our partners for helping to put this event together. Um, Tammy was here from the Saskatchewan Health Authority. They are a fantastic partner of the SIECs. We're very fortunate to work with them on all of our health-related events. And so thank you, Tammy. Thank you to the SHA. Uh, thank you one more time to the panelists for giving up their evenings to share their stories with you so that they can help um, as you decide what you want to do after high school. Thank you to Jody and uh, Saskatchewan Polytechnic for sharing the information about their programs. And I will include Jody's email address, if that's okay with you, um, Jody, in the email that goes out to everyone after the event. Um, that in that way, if anyone does have any questions, you can contact Jody and she can um, help guide you. I want to thank our partner school divisions, Greater Saskatoon Catholic Schools, Saskatoon Public Schools, Prairie Spirit School Division, and the Saskatoon Tribal Council for always supporting the SIEC in all of our events. Thank you to my colleagues who helped make this event happen tonight. And finally, thank you to everyone who tuned in or, or who decided to watch this recording. Um, we hope that you learned something. And most importantly, if you did learn something or especially if you didn't learn anything or you didn't enjoy the event, give us your feedback. We always want to know what you think of our events. We would love to host these events in person again, but right now that's not an option for us. So let us know what you think of our virtual events. Um, give us some feedback and we always like to have a little bit of fun and we'll have some draws for some gift cards. So give us some feedback and you could possibly win a gift card. Um, if you are a teacher, why won't my, can't find my mouse. <laughs> if you are a teacher and you're watching this as a career exploration event with your students, please provide us with some feedback as well. We would love to know your perspective as an educator, what you thought of our event tonight. And then if you watch the event tonight, and maybe you realize that healthcare might, or this area of healthcare might not be what you're interested in. We do have some other resources available on our website. We have our Spotlight on Dentistry video series. So we met with a dentist and orthodontist and some dental assistants this month to hear about their careers. Um, last year, we hosted our Spotlight on Nursing panel, which similar to this, but looking at nursing careers. And then last night, we hosted our Spotlight on Nursing event with Saskatchewan Polytechnic, the U of S, and the U of R talking about their program. So you could check those out if that's something you're interested in. And we also have a event from last year. We hosted our Physicians Career Panel, where we had a variety of doctors talk about their career. So be sure to check out our website. And if you watch this and you decided, I don't want to be in healthcare, maybe you want to explore some other areas or some other sectors moving forward. Every month we host events similar to this, where you get to learn about different careers. So um, be sure to check out our social media, be sure to check out our website and stay up to date on what we have coming in the next couple of months. So give us a follow see what's going on and hopefully you'll be able to explore some other careers moving forward. So thank you again for joining us this evening and we hope to see you at our events again soon.